Welcome to another edition, the Monday edition, of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 23rd of September, 2019. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, clergy and laity alike, welcome to the program. We're glad you're watching. I just looked over here on my screen, and it says we have... It's not Eye of the Tiger type stuff. We have close to 4,925 subscribers. Now, if you do your math, that means we're 75 decent viewers who haven't subscribed yet short of 5,000 that's a milestone I remember when we got our first subscriber thank you mom and uh, you know she just I was so oh we got a subscriber George oh is it my mom or your mom I don't know you know but it, we got a subscriber now we're 5,000 later it's, it's kind of cool so if you guys have not subscribed yet to the program go to our YouTube channel you're gonna go down there you see that little red subscribe button you click on it and a bill pops up, and the bell is to, to inform you the moment another episode comes out. Also, the comments are alive. You guys are there. You're giving your opinions. You're correcting us. Thank you uh, for when we make little itty-bitty mistakes. Not big theological stuff, just the small stuff, and we appreciate that. Uh, the comments are alive. That's where the program continues. When I click the off button and I click the upload button, we are glad you're here to take part in that like us on Facebook and like us on YouTube. We need that for the algorithms that help get this show launched further into the internet. Also, if you've not shared Anglican Unscripted with a dear friend lately, it's time. It, you need to take that big step and, and share. We're going to have liturgy here in a minute, but before we do, I thought we could talk a little bit. What? Oh, okay. this is the latest thing in seminary stuff. I will talk about that later. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about going here to my, my message. John Henry Newman, an Anglican turned Catholic. I hear that we have invited the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, to speak at Vespers. How do you no, feel we about haven't that? invited him. <laughs> We didn't We're invite We're Anglican, him. and that's what we mean. We did. Of course we did. Uh, give us the story, George. Uh, John Henry Newman, Cardinal Newman, of course, the, one of the most famous uh, Anglicans, uh, even, on, even by his own, even before his Catholic phase, one of the most famous men of uh, letters and religion in the 19th century in England. Poet, uh, theologian, great preacher is to be canonized, to be made a saint by the Catholic Church, and Westminster Cathedral, which is the Roman Catholic Cathedral in London, is having a service of Vespers in honor of this canonization, uh, October 13th or 19th, I believe. And the little advertisement came out, and at the, a pen to the bottom of the advertisement is that the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster is going to preside at the service, but has invited as the preacher uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. <laughs> Gavin. Now, this is a bit of a shock on a number of levels. <clears throat> Kevin, I'm, you're, you're luring me to be apoplectic. Uh, no, well, I know that you will handle this like a bishop. Uh, well, um, <laughs> the difficulty is, and, and, and I'm sorry if I'm going to offend some people, uh, now, um, but you see, there is a crisis um, existing between Anglicanism uh, and the Roman Catholic Church. One of the things that's happening at the moment is people, a quite considerable number of people are approaching me as Anglicans saying, has the time run out? Can we, should we, may we, may we go to Rome? 10% uh, of the Roman Catholic clergy in England are ex-Anglican clergy. That have gone over in the last 20 years or so and this isn't a this isn't a fad it isn't it doesn't show any um superficial dallying with an exotic culture this is a terrible crisis born 
out of the death of Anglicanism. Anglicanism has, has changed itself in relation to uh, the local culture. Now, it's not just Anglicanism. I read something in the Catholic Herald today saying that the um, Irish Roman Catholic bishops uh, are looking to make diocesan policy uh, to include the regularization of homosexual marriage and the ordination of women. Uh, in other words, they're quite as bad uh, as, as any part of the Anglican jurisdiction. So this is not a question of the grass being greener somewhere else. This is, this is a matter of the worldwide church facing seduction and corruption with modernity uh, and being lured away from biblical and apostolic values, roots and revelation. Uh, so the Catholics are having the same kind of trouble that we are. The difference is that they have a weight of tradition and dogma that means it'll be much harder for them to give in. So, that, for example, the bishop of this diocese in in uh, Ireland says, we have absolutely no power to augment any of these things, but we're just putting them out there to show we're sympathetic to them. The, the trouble with Anglicanism is it, had, it has no... Uh, uh, it, it has no dogma of its own to deal with the crisis, and so it, there's an element of disintegration. And that's one of the reasons why uh, this brings us back to Newman. Um, a number of people are, are, are looking to see whether or not they can be faithful to biblical and apostolic faith within Anglicanism, or whether they have to go to Rome to do it. Now, the reason... So, so Newman has become prophetic again. He, he tried to stay Anglican, in the 19th century and found that his conscience and the Holy Spirit moved him towards Rome. The same issues are reoccurring now uh, and, and the, the, the difficult, this is trying people's consciences enormously. Now, the real problem with, with Newman's canonization <laughs> is that he, he stands for a prophetic challenge both to Rome and to, and to Anglicanism. Um, but to invite the Archbishop of Canterbury who has gone on record as saying, He's a complete relativist when it comes to dogmatic and theological and philosophical issues. In other words, if it suits your spirituality to be Catholic, be Catholic. He doesn't mind. If it suits you to be Anglican, be Anglican. He doesn't mind. But there, is no, there is no issue of truth or reality. And to have him preach at this particular service strikes me as being in the worst possible taste by Cardinal, Cardinal Vincent Nichols. And, and it, I, it, it makes me weep. Well, I would say in the last month or two, we've learned from Justin Welby, it's okay to be Islamic. It's okay to be Hindu. It's okay to be Buddhist because God doesn't mind. You know, it's not just... It, 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 what was once just the, the Roman Catholic Anglican divide has gone much further with uh, Justin Welby. And I don't know if I would say it's a Roman Catholic Anglican divide because mm -hmm. Pope Francis in his Abu oh, no. Dhabi statement mm -hmm. has essentially uh, said what Justin Welby said. It's God created Islam uh, is uh, Pope Francis is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we would need to distinguish between Catholic bishops and dioceses and even Pope Francis and the Catholic tradition, the magisterium, because I would argue that the two are not uh, congruent at this stage. Yeah. Now, the, the, the problem I have, mm. yeah, I seem to have a lot of problems, I'm sorry, but I uh, am reading, I've been following very, my doctoral studies were in 19th century Anglican theology. Uh, John William Colenso, not John Henry Newman, but I essentially have read all of Newman's works and I had to Oh, he was a novelist and a poet. I just think a dreadful novelist and a dreadful poet, but a great theologian. Oh, Newman's uh, canonization process, if you are celebrating the man as holy, if you're celebrating the man for his contribution to Christian thought and Christian witness, yes, he's a saint. If you're taking the uh, miracle that is alleged to have occurred and saying this is the reason why he should make a saint, it raises all my Protestant hackles because it's such a silly reason to elevate this man to sainthood for what is allegedly the cause of a miraculous healing. Now, that is a today, and let's put that aside. But what Newman stands for in terms of intellect, in terms of faithfulness, in terms of godliness, is. Uh, public, those who are praising him publicly uh, stand four squared against it. 
George, one of the things that I feel most strongly, and I'll try and articulate as clearly as I can, because I think it's of the utmost importance. So forgive me if I don't do it very well, but the Reformation of the 16th century is over. It's not just over because the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics have reached a concordat in the last few years. It's over because the philosophical, cultural and spiritual clash uh, 500 years ago has moved on to something completely different. And, and there needs to be a new reformation today. And it's not about purgatory or, or, or grace and works, um, f faith and works. Uh, it's about rationalism, uh, modernity on one hand, and, and apostolic biblical faith on the other. And the fact is that the Roman Catholic Church is struggling in very much the same way as the Anglican Church is and other liberal Protestants. And if we continue to fight the ref battles of 500 years ago, we will not bring the energy to the table that we need to fight today. In other words, a, a very great deal of the values we represent theologically are shared by people like Cardinal Sarah uh, and others in Rome. And, of, and a good many of, of um, the values that Justin Welby epitomizes are shared by people like Sir Pope Francis, um, although he's, he's a much more complex fact character than Welby and much more theologically nuanced. Uh, but nonetheless, the point is that the issue for the cleansing and the reformation and the renewal of the church, they exist in utterly different categories to what they did 500 years ago. And we have to do everything we can to free ourselves from being stuck in the quicksand of that cast of mind to get with the to get with what Satan is doing to the church today, uh, in order to resist him and to cleanse and purify it, and that cuts right across the Catholic Protestant divide. But uh, there's an important point: what Satan is doing to the church today. Archbishop Justin Welby is going to uh, preach or teach or give a sermon at the Vespers for uh, John Henry Newman, with whom could not be a bishop in the Church of England. There's no way he would uh, pass muster and be elected a bishop there. Um, it, what being dead, it would be difficult. But well, I do okay, being be dead. That's so why I wanted wish, to bring but... the time thing. Uh, I, we can need to bring our audience up to date, too. We're recording this here at 3.53 Eastern Standard Time. If you want to add some hours, what time is it over there, well, Gavin? It's nearly, it's, it's nearly 8 o'clock, yes. Have you had, have you had dinner yet? I, I haven't eaten since 12.30. Okay. So, I get and, and, and 4 p.m. here is nap time for Kevin. I got to get my tea out here. I don't know where George is going. He's going to get some coffee, too. This is a late recording for us. Well, maybe George got raptured. Did he leave or did you see a poof? <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid a, a, a poof in English has a, an entirely different meaning, <laughs> Kevin, over here. So I'm not going to talk about That's George. right. We won't say that. Sorry, but, I forgot. Um, so I, I, I'm very, I mean, I might have gone to Vespers at Westminster Cathedral, but I'm, I won't go to mm -hmm. hear Mr. Welby preach. And I, I, it just it breaks my heart. What is Vincent Nichols doing inviting? It's not Welby's fault. No. But what on earth are they doing inviting Welby to do it? it it's, it's a triumph of diplomacy over an understanding of what the issues that the church is facing today. Um, Newman would be much, much uh, harsher towards Welby's theology and the way it's reflected in Anglicanism today than ever we have been. Okay, let's move on to our new topic. Next topic, we got George back, and we are going to talk I about... I apologize, Kevin. Uh, AA is meeting not in this building, but in the next building. So I'm dealing with the alcoholics while you're dealing with... Uh, heresy of the leadership in the church. That's all right. Well, I could, I, I could yeah. do with a very, very stiff drink. Yes, right. <laughs> so it, as far as I'm concerned, it, it's congruency in action. Well, it's almost five, and my rule is five is scotch time, but uh, not there yet. Let's move on to Union Seminary, U Union Theological Seminary. Uh, they Didn't they merge with EDS, George? Episcopal Divinity School merged with Union Seminary. Okay. The uh, buildings in Cambridge, Mass. are all sold up and gone, and the what's left of the library and its heritage has been shipped down to uh, Upper Manhattan. Okay. Well, uh, let me uh, put my Do Not Disturb back on it. It expired for some reason. Uh, Matt Kennedy put out a tweet that he retweeted from Union Theological Seminary. On that little tweet was a, a little jungle in the middle of an altar with some lady behind it uh, asking uh, repentance 
of or for the plants. Ask, asking plants for forgiveness. Asking the plants for forgiveness. And before we get, get into this, uh, the Carlson household is not known as people who help plants survive very long. And we got these off of Amazon. And I don't know what they're called, but we thought for sure if we kept watering them and stuff like that, that they would live. They're air plants, Kevin. You don't water them. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we have them in the trees here, naturally. There were like 24,000 wonderful comments on Amazon. Nobody could kill these. Well, guess what? <laughs> the Coulsons could kill these. Um, we don't get to have plants because we have a cat, and our cat chews the plants. So I thought I'd get something small I could hide away on the desk, and it, it just didn't work that well. So I am guilty of so many plant crimes over the last 30 years of our marriage and 50 years of my life. I've just, I'm a mess when it comes to uh, keeping things alive in the uh, uh, herb world. And I wanted to let you guys know that before we get too far, because if this comes out right, I probably need to repent to the plants as well. Uh, George, can you give us a, the story here? Why are we repenting now to plants? Well, Justin Welby went to Amritsar, uh, India, and he prostrated. Oh, it's a different repentance. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the uh, students, uh, a liturgy class at Union Theological Seminary came up with uh, the latest transgression by white men against the world. And that is our treatment of nature. No, not the animals. No, not the not the climate. It's not climate change. It's not veganism. It's that we are mean to plants. And we've not thanked plants for their role in creation and in our life and our rootedness and connect, get it? Rootedness? Connectedness to all living things. And so this class of uh, future Episcopal and Presbyterian ministers uh, did a, created a liturgy to atone for man's not women's, but man's inhumanity to White their fellow hands. Yes. <laughs> White, middle aged Episcopalian men with glasses and double chins, inhumanity to other plants. And hmm. this was celebrated. And as you say, this got picked up by the blogosphere, social media, even the national press, uh, who was saying, These people are cuckoo. They're not um, the various species of vegans and vegetarians and this and that. And these people take it so far that th the souls of plants are offended by our inhumanity towards them. Well, I don't know how you can be I've, inhumane to a plant, but there you are. I've met many clergy over the years, part of this ministry. You meet clergy. And sometimes they get talking, and they have wonderful, hilarious seminary stories. I was talking to um, Stephen O, and he, he related a couple that were just hilarious. And seminary, obviously, it's like college. It's a time to explore new ideas and stuff like that. But not all seminaries are the same. You're not going to see this at Dallas Theological Seminary. You're not going to see this at Trinity, Neshota, or Reformed Episcopal Seminary, George. No, and you know there are different ethos. At my seminary, we were warned not to wear our golf spikes into the chapel because uh, you know some of us would like to play golf before we started the day. Sure, you know, different ethos, different times. Um, Union Seminary is a very, very wealthy institution in upper in Upper Manhattan, tied uh, to Riverside uh, Church in Manhattan, and it is at the forefront of progressive Christian theology, and. This is the place where we first saw the experimentation with same-sex liturgies and the reparation theology of womenist theology. Uh, if any place can be called the epicenter of theological trendiness, it's Union Theological Seminary. And this is the latest outburst of it, of uh, species, speciesism. And although we of can preferring, preferring homo sapiens to the rest of creation. Although we can laugh at it, and it sounds ridiculous, it is in fact just a natural progression of the preference for the feminine theologically that we've been dealing with for the last 30 or 40 years. When, when some of our cathedrals hang up the moon in the transept and people look and say, isn't it wonderful? Isn't she wonderful? This, this resurgence of the feminine is always going to turn into application of creation and created order. 
And so um, the whole ecological movement um, is uh, an, uh, an outworking of this, of this theme. In the Old Testament, one of the reasons why God describes himself as father is to make a distinction between creator and creation. So whether or not God is father, the scripture says he is, even if he wasn't father but was only like father, it becomes a device to distinguish between transcendence and immanence, between creator and creation. The moment you ditch fatherhood in that sense, you render yourself prey to creation and the feminist uh, motherhood uh, and the whole ecological agenda. So actually, once you start moving down that path, you're inevitably going to take on an ecological plant-based agenda uh, that, that sees theological and spiritual virtue in creation uh, at which to which you will then want to placate it's only a it's, it's one step removed from fertility worship on the canaanite high places who are doing exactly the same thing but to get fed rather than to apologize for pollution now there's nothing really new about what yes the union seminary may have cloaked it in new vocabulary but this is an outworking of essentially the occult movements that began over a hundred years ago, of the divine feminine. Um, you can, if you will, throw in uh, very everything from Wagnerian operas to Jungian theology to uh, the latest trends out of Southern California. But what it is, it's a recreation of the earth goddess cycle, the, the birth and death of the god yeah. where the mother goddess not God the Father, is the paramount figure because the earth, the mother, is that which gives life. And this, this latest plant Eucharist, plant theology, plant confession is, a, as Gavin says, a natural outworking of quite a long uh, intellectual worldview that has um, calls for the dehumanization of, of, of people. It's what makes fetuses objects, not human beings. And what makes Jews subhuman beings, untermensch. Oh. It's all the same. It's what, it's what allows us to euthanize uh, old ladies with dementia or children with uh, uh, incurable handicaps. Because, the, you know, because life comes from the mother and be given by the mother, it's taken away by the mother, all in a grand cycle of life. Now, I know I sound like a Walt Disney movie in the circle of life and everything, but it is all tied in the same ethos of paganism and mother goddess worship. A couple of generations ago, Dietrich Bonhoeffer visited Union Theological Seminary, and I'm going to give you his quote after he spent a couple weeks there. He said, there's no theology here. They talk a blue streak without the slightest subjugate uh, foundation. The students are completely clueless with respect to what dogmatics uh, is really about. They are unfamiliar with even the most basic questions. They become intoxicated with liberal and humanistic phrases, laugh at the fundamentalist, and yet basically are not even up to their level. So nothing's changed. <laughs> in, in order to move on to the, uh, to the, the climate warming issue in a way mm -hmm. this, this extends, Kevin, could you tell us how many polar bears there are in the world today compared to um, well, I don't know. Pick any date you like out of history. Hold on one second. Okay, I can do that. Um, I actually days. know. I can't. What? I was going to Google this. All right. What do oh, you? Okay, George. <laughs> George. <laughs> George. <laughs> okay, George. There are thirty thousand polar bears in the wild today. That's more than I was a kid. Oh, well, did you know that when Al Gore was born, there were only seven thousand? Yeah, that's about what it says. Yeah. So, what does that tell us? Are they all drowning because the polar ice caps are melting? Or have uh, they all gone off the pill? What could you tell us? Well, from the video I saw from mm. Justin Welby today, climate emergency exists right now, right here. And obviously, this is the, the climate strike that's going on. And uh, that little girl, Greta, has been giving us uh, her rundown with all her years of experience in climate science studies. And I thought we could talk a little bit about what I want to... This is the only time we're going to ever uh, quote Dr. Sagan, but extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If we're going to go and change everybody's economy and make new rules about climate, we need to have long-term evidence of climate change. And guess what? We don't. The, all the graphs put out by the UN uh, this week 
about all the catastrophe going on are from the 1970s to now. What happened before 1970? I'm, I'm scientifically semi-literate, and so I'm hesitant to take this on a scientific basis. But one yeah. of the things that I'm clear about politically is that all the um, efforts that are being urged on the West by Greta uh, and, and the, the anti-warming movement are absolutely useless until you can persuade either, both the Indians and the Chinese to stop burning fossil fuel, fuel in the way that they are. In other words, the pressure, the, 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 the notion that, um, that things can be changed by pressurizing the Western economy without consent or change from the biggest polluters is complete nonsense. And therefore, there's an element of illusion about it. But I think theologically, there's something wrong as well. Um, if, if having lost the faith, you think there is only this life, then inevitably this invests the world, the mother world, with a degree of importance um, that otherwise she wouldn't have. But in Christian terms, of course, um, we know perfectly well that the world is in trouble. St. Paul says in Romans 1 that there is a link metaphysically between our sins and the groaning of the world as it waits for the redemption of Christ. So Christians are inevitably going to be less anxious about the fate of Mother Earth than other people because we expect the climax to be the return of Christ and our transition into the new heaven and the new earth. That doesn't give us any kind of permission to be casual the way in which we pollute. I'm enraged about plastic pollution, mm -hmm. for which I think there is no excuse whatsoever. And I'll put my effort and weight into any movement at all that reduces the poisoning of our environment by plastic. Yeah. But, I took, but, but, but I just wanted to say that once again, the bifurcation it seems to me to be between uh, an essentially idolatrous movement which sets up the earth as but once again as the offended uh, object of our worship and veneration uh, and a christian view which sees a transitoriness in the universe that we are moving through uh, and, and requires good stewardship of us whilst we move through but much less anxiety so the state of anxiety between the two movements if if, if you like the theological or the spiritual litmus test between these two ways of being human. I think My, that's it. Well, let me just con concur with Gavin here about the Indian China thing. If you really ask yourself how this could uh, be solved, which would have a greater impact, reducing America's fossil fuel fuels by 30% or China's by 1% or India's by 1%? They're building fossil fuel plants every day. and we haven't built one in a long time. You have to look at this, why is this always a white privilege thing? Why is this always uh, taking on the West? And are we having climate change? Yes, since day one, when God said, let there be light, the climate has been changing. And uh, it's a reality, but Gavin's point about this doesn't end with polar caps, this ends with Jesus, you yeah. know? Okay, George, your turn. Well, I was going to uh, just mention that from a uh, symbolism, or from, Gavel's the symbolic, Gavin's the symbologist here. He's yes, much yes, better. He's good. Than yes. I, perhaps I should use a better word, but the having a rather harsh faced 12, 13, 14 year old girl in blonde pigtails telling the world that there are too many black and brown babies and is just. All I could think of is when I see this little girl on TV is the movie Triumph for the Will of the Nuremberg rallies of the girls in the League of German, Na uh, German Maidens calling for uh, the master race and the Aryan race because of their absolute utter conviction of the truth of what they think and believe. Part of the marks of a failed culture is that it allows it puts children in places of authority. We saw this in the Soviet Union. There was the cult of Pavlik Morozov. During the collectivization and the Stalinist era, there was a young boy who informed on his parents for hoarding grain mm -hmm. and the village and his parents were arrested and executed. <clears throat> and the villagers murdered the boy for having turned in his parents to the uh, NKVD. This boy was canonized and made a saint of the Soviet Union and part of the mystique and mythology of Soviet Stalinist culture was that children should inform on their parents. The army of Pol Pot were 14, 15, 16 year olds. The army 
and we're in of these children who are actually the people with the least amount of knowledge in our society are being put forward as the avatars of truthfulness and virtue. When that happens, we know society is utterly and completely broken and corrupt. Now, I don't know anything about uh, Greta Thunberg. I don't know if she's a sweet girl. I don't know if she's an evil girl. I'm frankly not interested. What I think is her parents have allowed her to be used to dehumanize the world, uh, those less fortunate, those less educated, those less affluent than she is, for essentially what is an evil purpose. You recently saw Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's a hero to some on the left, who's a very competent and also a very controversial Supreme Court justice, repeating one of Margaret Sanger's phrases that abortion is necessary to keep down the undesirable population. In the United States, that means black people. Uh, and yet this is hailed as being courageous and bold, when in a Christian worldview, this is evil. And this is the face that evil has taken in the 20th century, the harsh-faced little girl with pigtails. I would say to liberal United States, this means black people. You know, and it's it's so hard to watch. I was reading the 21 quotes of uh, Margaret uh, Sanger, and she was nasty, mm -hmm. very nasty. Okay, gentlemen, we have one last topic before Gavin gets to have supper. We're, we're, not, we're not trying to starve you out here. Uh, we're going to do a follow-up to uh, the Jonathan Fletcher story. Obviously, we covered this a couple months ago. It made headlines everywhere. It was going to be the, the story of a downfall of an evangelical in the Church of England. And all of a sudden, the story stopped. I mean, it stopped cold. All our sources uh, turned on us. Um, and we are now going to tell you about the follow-up. George. Jonathan Fletcher, the man at the center of this controversy, along with the late Jonathan Smythe, uh, had, an art, had a letter in Evangelicals Now, a monthly uh, newspaper for the evangelical movement in England, UK. And in it, he offered words of apology um, that I won't characterize, I'll leave Gavin to characterize it, but what has happened is that the evangelical establishment and has essentially choked off the discussion and investigation of Fletcher and others' abuse. The story is dead because those who have uh, who could speak to the crimes as victims are being warned off, are being shut down, or are being uh, basically told, "Well, you brought it on yourself. It takes two to tango. If you engaged in homoerotic games, and and now it's thirty, forty years later. Do you really want it to come out to your congregation, or to your friends, or to your wife, or your children, that you played in this way? So there's a really nasty hardball uh, behind the scenes taking place, and a team of uh, independents and uh, uh, Church of England ministers uh, have uh, written an open letter. Its lead lead author is Melvin Tinker, a friend of who's been on this show a number of times, which is published on Anglican Inc. and other outlets basically going through uh, Jonathan Fletcher's uh, apology. And Gavin, I'll let you take what, that, what, the, what the Tinker clan is, uh, is, is raising about Fletcher's words. Well, Melvin, and An Melvin Tinker and Andrew Greyston um, are alarmed that uh, the cover-up by conservative evangelical pressure groups has been so effective. Uh, it was always going to be a danger that it might be so. There's been the, the cover-up in terms of Smythe, uh, the Smythe crisis, which which I think extends uh, as far as Justin Welby, um, and involves many of the same people. Jonathan Fletcher was part of this um, nobody's club that some really quite seriously well-connected people in our society belong to. And the church is, to, to be Christian, the rules are very clear. Um, when you fail, because we all fail, we're required to confess and to repent and then to ask God for help to change. If we don't do that, we stop being Christian de facto. And the problem with the Jonathan Fletcher abuse is, is the abuse was bad enough, but the, the, the falling short of practical Christianity that the cover-up has constituted uh, is is alarming and very depressing. And one of the reasons that Melvin and Andrew have written this letter is to draw attention to the fact that 
this is a, a subsequent crisis, a secondary crisis, which, which will stop any healing taking place, both for the victims themselves, uh, also for accountability for Jonathan Fletcher, but also for the churches that nurtured um, the culture in which Jonathan Fletcher was able to continue this for so long. One of the difficulties I'm having is uh, it betrays once again my ignorance of the English uh, tribal system. I want to praise uh, Melvin Tinker and Andrew Greystone, who are on the opposite sides of many of the issues within the Church of England. They're working together for the common good, even though they are in different tribes. When this story first began breaking, I would talk to people across the tribal spectrum. And the story would develop, develop, and then all of a sudden I was being shut out by some who uh, were basically warned off that, well, you know, this, this, this is man is Gavin Ashenden's friend. He's an arch homophobe and my goodness, you can't talk to them, even though you're on side on this issue, you know, you don't want to be linked with them. And part of my discouragement, and this, but this is not universal. This is far from universal. There are a number of people who are pro very progressive. Uh, some are out are gay activists who have, we have worked with and who we have, who have been very particularly brave in this story of seeking the truth, even though it is against their political and uh, professional interests. And then at the same time, we see that the tribal wars are breaking up and conservatives, some conservatives, not all, some are protecting Fletcher because he's on side. Some liberals won't talk to us because we're not on side. And just the muddle through worldview of uh, Anglicanism seems to be taking over. Truth is the victim here. Hmm. Hate to leave uh, leave you guys with all that, but uh, that's going to be the end of the show. George and I are heading to uh, Ridgecrest, North Carolina, for the new Wineskins Conference. You're going to go there early. What are you doing? I'm uh, leading a little uh, workshop for ACNA communicators on how to interest the press. Uh, in your press releases, right. uh, what not to do, how to convince or editors that your stuff is so good that you don't even have to bother reading it. You just reprint it, um, which is what a lot of people do. How do you get to that position? How do you craft your work such that it is immediately uh, devoured by your audiences in the media? And I will be packing the Anglican TV cameras into the back of my car so we can live stream the event uh, for New Wineskins. You can find the live stream on their Facebook page, uh, New Wineskins. I will again put a link to that in the show notes so you guys can follow. I think Thursday night at 7 p.m.-ish is when the live stream starts. Yes, George? I do want to say that Gavin's life has been much more exciting than yours and mine, Kevin. Uh-oh. He is now the in-house crank for the BBC. <laughs> That's right. We saw that. <laughs> they had him on radio and tele he's on television. That it was on, now he's on radio. Every issue he was on. Was it yesterday, Gavin, or the day before? They, they, this yesterday BBC Sunday program. Oh, well, was, the, the Sunday program dropped me at the last minute, but BBC London were kind enough to run it. Yes, I, I say to the Lord, um, okay, so we've been busy in the media this month. I, I expect this is the end of the run now. And, um, uh, you know, I, I shall be quietly rusticated by the Holy Spirit. But, but, but so far, every month produces some form of excitement where they, uh, the media come to me to ask me for a comment. And for as long as they do, well, I'll, I'll try and give them one. Well, because of the cathedral craziness in the Church of England, your 15 minutes of fame has been extended and extended and extended. And However, <laughs> that's right. Well, there are 58 or 56 cathedrals in the UK. Um, <laughs> So, Gavin, you've only Before. hit five or six, yeah, so, you've, so. Got, you've got a year's solid craziness ahead of you. I, but I, I rather think that the, uh, the, the even the media's uh, excitement about what the cathedral can get up to has been stretched to its limit. I can't imagine how, how the cathedrals could be could produce any more nonsense that would, that would top what's happened already. Yeah, that sounds it, like a challenge. You know, George, yeah, does that sound like a challenge? I told you that a, a seminary in the United States would be having planned <laughs> confessions. Would you think such thing was possible? No, but it, but, but it may very well if, if it may very well catch on to one of our local deans who will sort of start start a spiritual Kew garden in his in his sanctuary cathedral to provide absolution for people who haven't found it in Christ yet. I'm waiting for a cathedral in England to use marijuana for incense. That would be fun. That would just you know. 
That's the next thing above Helter Skelter. Gavin, you have Friday off. George and I are traveling. And Mm. we'll see everybody back here when we have 5,000 subscribers next Monday. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been listening to episode 538, Magna Can Unscripted. <laughs>